So without further ado, thank you all for joining us today and let's get started. Let's give a warm welcome to Lynn Hunsaker, our first presenter. Lynn is the Chief Customer Officer at Clear Action Continuum. Not only is she the co-founder of the Experience Value Exchange, a platform that helps marketing CX, CS, and EX roles bridge the gap between promises and customer experiences, but she also has an impressive background in some of the largest companies in the world. Throughout her career, Lynn has made significant contributions to the field of customer experience, including serving on the board of CXPA and led the world's first global study of B2B CX practices. Lynn's expertise has earned her the distinction of being one of the Hall of Fame award recipients as an author at customerthink.com. So, Lynn, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing with us how to to shape your firm's growth curve through CX Insights. Thanks, Dennis. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited to share this really really important topic of how to use our customer experience insights to shape your firm's growth curve, something that we should be thinking about uh, so much these days. Fantastic. Well, Lynn, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thanks, Dennis. So kicking off this uh, CX Awards 23, some uh, food for thought for 2024. All the growth sources in your company include your existing customers and new customers, which are quite familiar to us in customer experience management. Add to that new market expansion, also new product development and launches. And then we have business models being created all the time to uh, serve new customers or to expand the profitability and ac acquisitions and mergers of businesses. And add to that just strategic planning, which really is a fine tuning your capabilities across the organization for the coming opportunities in the year. So in thinking about that, I'd like to direct your attention to this study by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology where they've studied over uh, around 1,200 uh, innovations and divided them by the ones who were inspired internally versus the ones that were inspired by customers. And it was about a 50-50 split, but the ones that were inspired by customers actually grew revenue eight times higher than the ones that were inspired internally. So I think this is a good uh, reminder to us to make better use of our customers from experience insights across all these growth opportunities. So let's take a quick look at that. You know, in customer experience feedback, there is so much beyond surveys. There's a lot of things where customers are telling us how they feel because they need help or because they uh, need to vent or, you know, be heard. Um, there's a lot of inter informal interactions and other ways that we collect information about the interactions that uh, happen. But nowadays, we have a huge treasure trove of customer experience insights digitally. And that's through our own apps and websites and so much more. In fact, you know, if we use this feedback first, I like to call it almost free VOC. And that includes maybe uh, connecting with your customer facing people periodically and hearing what they're observing, seeing because there's so much in body language and things that might be missed in formal feedback. So, uh, you know, this really opens up the doors to inspiring so many things around our company. And in fact, when you're using surveys, I really recommend to base them on what you already know from unsolicited feedback and internal sources. Then we can make the surveys a lot more interesting for everyone to participate in and everyone to learn from. So start first with your almost free VOC and then build your surveys from there. 
Now, not only do we have the survey dashboards, but we need to make even more custom intelligence from that in terms of looking for patterns. And you can find the trends, of course, in VOC, but how about beyond that? Using cross tabs where you're comparing one survey question to another, or perhaps in the unsolicited feedback, one dimension or one behavior to another behavior. So cross tabs and, and other uh, types of analyses and visual data visualization can help us to, to find those patterns and even perhaps cause and effect. I found it extremely en enlightening to connect different sources of VOC, for example, whatever marketing was collecting in their uh, customer research and then what service was collecting what we were getting from social media and uh, even r d sometimes does studies with customers to understand uh, what's what's coming up what are some of the trends for use and uh, innovation so when you tap into all these different sources it can be extremely enlightening now text mining audio mining and video mining have been around at least 15 years but when i ask any room of cx people how many of you are making use of this it's always a very small percentage. And when I ask them in what ways are you using text mining or other types of mining, it's usually very cherry picked and it's just a huge opportunity. I would put uh, my investment in uh, data mining if I were uh, in a role to decide what kind of technology, if I, if I were limited, I would put uh, data mining as top of the list. But then there's all kinds of bells and whistles and most of the technologies that we have available to us with multivariate analysis, including predictive analytics and so much more to find these patterns that might help to inspire all of our processes and policies and strategies and all the people across our organization who are involved in these things. Even when you have people who are looking for cost containment and ways to uh, reorg or uh, you know revise things because of remote or hybrid working situations or situations with customers uh, nowadays in the 2020s uh, there's so many opportunities for us to just tap people on the shoulder and say hey guys we have some really interesting insights that might be useful in what you're working on so i'd like you to take a moment to just think about existing customers new markets business models new products and acquisitions and mergers. How do your customer experience insights guide growth in each of these endeavors? If not now, what could you do tomorrow or next week even to start inspiring and guiding those growth opportunities? Now, to give you a little bit more to go on, be thinking about your existing customers and how well we're using customer experience insights there. I think we've done a pretty good job of increasing fans through referrals, driving the promoters and so forth. Agile design is a huge opportunity that we've been uh, embracing for a few years. Upselling and cross-selling have certainly been a, a big endeavor for the past 20, 25 years. But not only unlocking value for your existing customers, how about stopping waste? So this includes um, reducing churn, which of course everyone's involved in, uh, resolving issues and preventing issues, getting to the real root of things to stop the nonsense and uh, you know have all the savings from that. So there's a lot of opportunity with our existing customers. Now the next uh, growth opportunity is uh, is your uh, new markets. So attracting fans, maybe from a different uh, cross-section of, of uh, the consumers or, or industries, or it could be a new geography, territory. So I recommend to use customer experience sites to help the company understand what are the costs to serve this type of customer, that type of customer, and so on. And when you understand the cost to serve, insert that into the ideal customer profile for these new markets. Because most of the time, your business development people are doing this rather blindly, and they're only looking at what is the revenue potential or which uh, verticals are the most lucrative. But they're not looking at cost to serve in terms of what are your sweet spots for delivering to the expectations you're setting. And so that brings us to 
uh, understanding the expectations of these different customer types and making that well known across your marketing and salespeople to manage the expectations from the very beginning and carry that through the entire life cycle or end to end customer journey. And even more, we can use customer experience insights about these new markets to set standards for all of the operational groups across your company so that they are meeting or exceeding those expectations. Now, the, the plain definition of customer experience success or even business success is simply, are you meeting or exceeding your customer's expectations? And secondly, are you doing it better than anyone else? So this is a real key area to be educating our work groups across the company. And in addition, setting those standards for our partners and even suppliers. So the next growth opportunity is business models. You have a lot of people in different groups. They could be product groups, marketing groups, even strategic planning group and, and on down the line, quite a lot of people thinking about new ways to uh, shape your pricing structure to make things available to customers. And so here we have usually a whole group of people out there that are unserved customers. This is a huge opportunity to learn about them through customer experience insights. There must be a lot of clues in this unsolicited feedback, the almost free VOC that can uh, really enlighten the people who are creating business models. And predictive analytics has, uh, of course, you know, the real time opportunities and service, but even more so for your what if scenarios that marketing and uh, operations can be uh, considering for uh, warranties versus discounts versus pricing at different levels or, you know, very, so many different aspects of uh, business models and rolling uh, products and, and services out to new markets. Predictive analytics can be quite helpful, but that's all based on what are you collecting for customer experience insights. Furthermore, uh, segmentation can be uh, even more successful if you're basing the segments on expectations patterns that you're seeing across the end-to-end -end journey. If you have a consistency of uh, concerns or uh, emotion among different customer groups, uh, about risk aversion, for example, or timeliness, or simplicity, or empowerment, those would be an expectation segment that would really help to guide these business models and other growth opportunities much more successfully. For new products, um, this is all about expanding your fans uh, and also expanding the lifetime of your existing customers so you want to look for underserved customers and overserved customers and consider how you can make light versions or less complicated versions for, for the uh, for the overserved customers and then of course more sophistication for underserved customers and always we should be using customer experience insights for launch dates and of course for human centered design keeping things agile and making sure we're checking in with customers and making sure we're touch, uh, revisiting what we know about what's uh, what's so important to our customers and when we do this and take a little bit of time we're going to have a lot more successful rollouts so the marketing plan is real uh, critical for including customer experience insights to make sure we're hitting all the buttons uh, correctly now for mergers and acquisitions you're actually multiplying your fans and so uh, here you want to pay attention to your brand essence from the very beginning. Take a, a close look at your own customers' ideas of what's sacred about your brand. What are the aspects that if those are missing or negated in the future, it's no longer your brand. You know, it doesn't really feel like hand and glove situation. Um, and then do that for the other brand that you're merging with or acquiring. And find that sweet spot so that you can uh, focus on the strengths of both brands. Now, I want to tell you just a very quick story about brand essence. J.C. Penney, maybe 10 or 10 or so years ago, hired the uh, guru behind Apple stores, the guy who figured out how to make Apple stores so uh, successful, the genius bars and everything. So J.C. Penney board of directors hired that guy to be the CEO of J.C. Penney. 
And at that time, he decided to make uh, JCPenney logo a square and uh, create a square deal, everyday savings and no more of these darn back to school sales and Christmas sales and, you know, all the flyers that they have to uh, put in the newspapers and things. And uh, they also got uh, Ellen DeGeneres as a spokesperson to talk about the square deal on television ads. And, uh, you know, they made a number of other changes. Now, J.C. Penney was over 100 years old already, and so they had a very entrenched customer base that was very, uh, you know, used to certain things and valued certain things. I'm not quite sure how much research they did in making all those decisions, but I can tell you from several news stories that they lost a quarter of a billion dollars, a quarter, yeah, every quarter. And so after they four quarters, they decided, well, the CEO wasn't quite working out for us, and they ended up getting a new CEO. So that's the importance of paying attention to the brand essence, using customer experience insights for all those kinds of decisions. It's very critical. And luckily, they were able to turn around a lot of things at JCPenney after that. So in your integration plan for mergers and acquisitions, always use customer experience insights to influence as much as possible not just your marketing aspects, but everything as much as possible. Because the more we're in line, the more successful we'll be. Every model I see from the big consulting firms about acquisitions and mergers shows culture like at the end of the, of the plan. I'd say put it at the beginning of the plan because all you, culture really is is how people think and do. So understand each entity's overall thinking and doing. And again, find that sweet spot and drive that culture to alignment with what's important to your customers. Then there's further that you can use your customer experience sites to influence the employee experience and partner experience to have that commonality and alignment. Finally, on strategic planning, this is all about fortifying your plans. So take your SWOT analysis and start with customer experience insights. What are their ideas of opportunities and threats and strengths and weaknesses? and then add your own. I really found a super success by using the relationship surveys just before the strategic planning survey, uh, strategic planning process ha happens. And if I did a, a like a road trip around the world to read out the relationship survey and get people to create action plans on that survey before the strategic planning starts, that's a huge uh, customer centricity uh, advantage that is built into your strategic planning mindset. Further, you can take customer experience insights and help people think about why does their department exist? What's the charter according to why customers are paying for your group? Why are they paying for your role? And redefine your job description like that. Customer experience insights can be important standards for every job role. So in closing, thinking about the internally inspired growth that you're currently pursuing with existing customers, new markets, business models, new products, and strategic planning. Would you like to increase that by up to eight times what you're currently getting? I encourage you to give it a try in 2023 and 2024 and see what kind of gains you can get by making customer experience insights a much greater shaper of this growth curve. Thanks so much, and let's keep in touch. Awesome presentation, Lynn. Thank you so much. We have a few extra minutes, so I know there's got to be some questions from the audience, but if you don't mind, Lynn, while we wait for some audience questions, audience, please type your questions into the chat window, and we'll be sure to answer those. I'm sure Lynn is anxious to answer some of your more in-depth questions. But while we're waiting for some of those questions, Lynn, I might ask, I just want to follow up on a couple of these ideas. Yeah. What I really found interesting about what you were saying is paying attention to the brand essence. It's so important. You brought up JCPenney, but I think we can all think of a couple of other brands who are going through some similar customer experience revelations at the moment. And my question is, can you elaborate, how much does the brand essence live in the hearts and minds and souls of the executives of the 100-year-old brand? And how much of that brand essence really lives in the hearts and minds of the customers? How do you, how do you navigate that? 
well, you've got to pay attention first and foremost to what it means to customers because they're the ones who are using it. They're the ones who have a sense of why they're using it and what it's doing for them and how it compares to other alternatives that they know about. And so when you understand those uh, core factors, it's just really important to respect it. Say, for example, McDonald's, what is their brand essence? Well, fast, uh, low cost, and family friendly, right? So if they were to introduce uh, an expensive hamburger or you know some advertisement that is uh, a little bit uh, risque, you know, not family friendly, uh okay. or they were going to take you know 20 minutes to 30 minutes to deliver something it's just not mcdonald's anymore right and so it turns people off and uh and they just don't they don't prefer it it really erodes trust when you don't understand the brand essence and respect it because people want to be able to rely on things they want some degree of predictability even though they are also excited about seeing new things it just needs to be in alignment with your general theme and that is in your customers' heads more so than the executives. Understood. It, and you know, that really points to something else you said about putting this customer understanding at the front of the strategic process. And I think you were talking about this mostly in the context of the overall operations growth, the management of an enterprise. But it sounds like that's also true for a campaign, for instance. If if we're going to introduce a new product or introduce a new target segment, what is the right way, if, if you could elaborate, on how to gather the customer intelligence or the voice of the customer or the customer input around the change that's about to happen with the brand? Well, if you're looking at customer service call logs, for example, uh, most of the time it's this calls being recorded for quality purposes. How about yeah. using it for innovation purposes? Okay, so you can uh, blank out the the uh, identifiers so you can keep it anonymous or just look at the pool of data, right? You don't need to have any kind of associated uh, private uh, information. But what you're looking for is the customer said, I'm trying to do X, but then Y happened. And now Z is my consequence, pure gold. You're never gonna get that degree of detail from your surveys or you know, very, very much less and not uh, as much of a, a representation either. So use data mining, use voice mining, whatever you need to, to harvest that treasure trove in customer service and other almost free VOC. When you find out what customers uh, you know, really get passionate about, what makes their, their tone of voice change for the negative and for the positive, those are the moments of truth. Those are the things that are precious to them. Those are the things that they get really riled up when, you know, it's not there, it's not cool. So that tells you a lot about brand essence. You know, Lynn, I'm just gonna go on the record as saying, this call being recorded for innovation purposes is probably one of the coolest things I've ever heard a CXer say. We have a question from Neil. Um, question is, Lynn, the five recommendations to try in 2024 are very easy to say, but not so easy to do. How do you recommend we can learn more about these, such as acquisition? Well, you know, one of the things that I found to be so useful is to go make friends with people who are in those decision-making capacities in your company, right? Understand what they're pursuing, uh, understand their mindset, what are the things that they're seeing as what's in it for me and what's not in it for me uh, from, from their own viewpoint and from the company's viewpoint? And when I know that, then it helps me to look for the types of insights that would be useful to them and also to maybe shape them, shape their thinking in ways that uh, course corrects, but might not be on track according to what I'm seeing in the customer experience insights. So, so there's a lot of ways that I, I really start with dedicating some of your uh, work work time percentage to understanding very clearly the mindsets of these different internal stakeholders because they're the ones who have to use the customer experience insights you want them to you have to actually have to follow what i call the six a's okay the six a's of customer experience success are ask so base things on what customers are telling you or what you're asking them 
Second, absorb. Third, adopt. Fourth, act or apply. Fifth, account, so be accountable. And sixth, applaud. So that's really the sequence of things. If you're a customer experience leader, you need to be helping all the work groups in your company to absorb these customer experience insights that you've asked about or customers have asked you. <laughs> and anyhow, you have this, this huge treasure trove of data. Uh, help them absorb it, which means they need to kind of create empathy and uh, you know it needs to they need to stand in the customer's shoes adopt it is they see they are own, owning these gaps and opportunities so you do that usually by showing them the cost of involved how much money is going out the window it's very very much more uh motivating than we think and possibly even more motivating than how much possible extra revenue there is but anyway money talks for adopting then get them to act on it, especially around root causes, and uh, figure out how you're going to account for that action plan being fulfilled 100%, and then applaud success, of course. You know, that's such a great recipe, Lynn. And what I, what I like about this is you have engagement and action throughout your entire prescription. And, and Neil says thank you as well. Lynn, can we talk a little bit more about the underserved and overserved customers? And, and as I was listening to you talk about the approach to, to operationalizing growth and the idea that not all customers are equal, but at the same time, you know, can you just elaborate? I'm curious. Some voices of customers are louder than others. And are those the underserved customers or are those the overserved customers? How do you put into perspective the wide body of customers and find that prioritization that allows us as CX leaders to make insightful short term changes that gather support from our peers? Right. So it's not really a matter of loudness. It's a matter of looking for patterns in the customer experience insights. And this goes beyond ratings. Now, ratings can be useful, but comments are really where the gold is. And so when you look for those patterns, you're looking for places where people were like, you know, this is overwhelming, or, uh, you know, I, I only use a part of this, or I am only, you know, what are they using just a part of it? They're kind of overwhelmed. That tells you that's an overserved customer group. Right. So that tells you there's a possibility for setting up something that's light for them and even being more successful with that particular uh, group in the population. Right. So it could be a huge population that you haven't really tapped into because you're you're too sophisticated, you know, too, too much for them. So light version can open up a lot of potential for new revenue and profitability. And then the same goes for the people who overserve. So it's not a matter of loudness, it's a matter of patterns. Okay, I think we'll last then with just a second. All right. Yeah, so I can tell you that uh, when you're looking at unserved, underserved, and overserved customers, uh, there's also that other group that's served correctly, right? So you might have four breakouts of, of customers when you're looking at what are the uh, elements that, that you're hitting the sweet spot on and what are the ways that you can increase sophistication or decrease sophistication or make things more available. For example, vending machines is one way that we serve unserved customers, people who don't have uh, access to your product or service, they can get it through a vending machine or through an app or you know online because they're not close to a physical distribution place. So unserved customers are also a huge opportunity for expanding your value. Wow. I I literally could sit here and talk to you all day. We have only five more five more minutes in, in this in, in this Say that again. We have, we have five more minutes. 
And I want to just, can you expand on, when you talked about putting culture at the front of CX, can you, can you talk a little bit more about the power of doing that? Because so oftentimes I think when we go into the planning stages, we're looking at the outcomes and not the momentum that we built within our organization. Would you agree with that or am I off base here? Well, you have to look at where your budget and revenue, where your budget and salary and dividends are coming from, right? They come from customers. So customers pay for salaries and budgets and dividends. Simple. Now, who creates the value for customers to pay for that? Employees. And who delivers it? Partners. Okay, I understand that's a little bit fuzzy, but generally, you know, we can just say it that simply. So if you're thinking about things with the cart, with the horse before the cart, okay, I mean, just common sense. Respect your customers first. They're the source of money. So what the heck did they really care about? Make that the watchword. This is a North Star. You might be thinking you see everything because we're living in modern times. But let's just be thinking about the guys in the 1700s, 1600s, where they didn't have any kind of uh, navigation instruments. They had to rely on the North Star. The customer is your doggone North Star, right? Let's just respect that. Second, employees are how you get there. Now, the fact that we have so much grief with employees these days, I think it just underscores how we have not put culture first in growth opportunities and especially mergers and acquisitions and reorganizations culture is how people think and do and we've set that as a group you know how does a group think and do now you can shift that customer experience the leaders can have a huge influence on culture in the way that you collect and share and advocate customer experience insights because if you get one group to be thinking to absorb something and to be thinking wow that can't stand we've got to make a change well, you're shaping people's thinking and doing right there. You're making a modification in culture. If you maintain that for six days, which means you have to establish accountability and applauding, right? So uh, if all of these things uh, actually start with what do customers see as the opportunities and threats and what do customers see as the strengths and weaknesses, and then add your own ideas or add custom, add employees after that would probably be the best thing. So change the way you're collecting insights about employees just in accordance with what I just showed you, the almost free VOC, almost free VOE, and then use partners as a third layer, and then your own wisdom as being a guru in your own field. I would put it like that. Respect the hand that feeds you, customers, employees, partners, and yourself in that order. Well, that... <laughs> I'm so glad I'm here with you today, learning these things, having the the insight from the customer first and then bringing it almost back as a filter or I guess more like an accelerator to to your own business's strategic process. It's invaluable insights. The last thing you have, we have about one minute left, Lynn, but since I have you here, I'd love to just ask you this question. It's a topic that's across our industry right now. I just love to get your perspective. I've been hearing a lot of people talk about EX and CX, EX being so important and pivotal to the success of all brands this year. And it feels to me like it's gaining momentum. Would you agree with that? Or can you give us some insights about what we should be paying attention to there? Last Absolutely. thoughts. Absolutely. Yeah, since the beginning of the pandemic, EX has become so much more important. And particularly after uh, mid-2020, when we were having a lot of uh, awareness, the new awareness of uh, the importance for equity, inclusion, and diversity. Um, I saw a lot of customer experience people going into that role uh, in my LinkedIn network, so that's great. Um, so I think there's definitely been a real awakening about the employee the importance of employee experience. Now that's been exacerbated by the great resignation and also quiet quitting and other things that are very unproductive for our gross domestic product and uh, company growth, uh, you know, to say the least. 
But, um, you know, I think that it's a misnomer that employees satisfaction comes first. You have to respect the hand that feeds you customers. For example, I go into a, a ice cream shop because I want to celebrate something and the employees are having a great time with really loud music that is, you know, grating to me. It, it destroys the whole ice cream experience, right? So, 100%. you know, be true to your brand essence, respect your customer's brand essence <laughs> in what you're doing with your, your employees. And also let's start just being more, more aware of the almost free BOE. What are their values? What are they trying to get done? What frustrates them? What uh, creates their joy? What are they trying to get done through your brand? And listen very differently so that you can find that alignment. And, uh, you know, I think everyone will be much happier in the world because of that alignment. Lynn, I love what you said. Respect the hand that feeds you. Thank you so much for being here today on CX Trend Talks. We'll be seeing you later in the panel discussion. Is that right? Fantastic. Looking forward to it, Dennis. Thank hey, you. Thank you so much for being here today, Lynn. My pleasure.